historical context to Ezekiel in our, our uh, Second Kings passage uh, this morning. Ezekiel was a, a prophet who got carried off in that first that first exile that we saw in, in 2 Kings 24. Uh, and um, so he writes from exile and answers some questions that uh, God's people had as they uh, sat in exile over in Babylon and wondered about the people who had been left in Jerusalem and the people who had gone off into exile and what was Israel's future. So we look at... Uh, Ezekiel chapter 36 this morning, and we'll look at uh, uh, three patches of, of verses uh, from that. So Ezekiel chapter 36, beginning in verse 5, uh, this is God's word, eternally true. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. In my burning zeal I have spoken against the rest of the nations and against all Edom, for with glee and with malice in their hearts they made my land their own possession, so that they might plunder its pasture land. Therefore prophesy concerning the land of Israel, and say to the mountains and hills, to the ravines and valleys, This is what the Sovereign Lord says, I speak in my jealous wrath, because you have suffered the scorn of the nations. Therefore this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I swear with uplifted hand that the nations around you will also suffer scorn. But you, O mountains of Israel, will produce branches and fruit for my people Israel, for they will soon come home. I am concerned for you and will look on you with favor. You will be plowed and sown, and I will multiply the number of people upon you, even the whole house of Israel. The towns will be inhabited and the ruins rebuilt. I will increase the number of men and animals upon you, and they will be fruitful and become numerous. I will settle people on you as in the past and will make you prosper more than before. Then you will know that I am the Lord. I will cause people, my people Israel, to walk upon you. They will possess you and you will be their inheritance. You will never again deprive them of their children. Now go down to verse 24, same chapter, Ezekiel 36, and verse 24, and we'll read a few verses there. Chapter 36, verse 24. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will, re re will remove from, your heart, from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. You will live in the land I gave your forefathers. You will be my people, and I will be your God. Now move down just a few verses to verse 33. Ezekiel 36, verse 33. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. On the day I cleanse you from all your sins, I will resettle your towns, and the ruins will be rebuilt. The desolate land will be cultivated instead of lying desolate, in the sight of all who pass through it. They will say, this land was laid waste, that was laid waste has become like the Garden of Eden. The cities that were lying in ruins, desolate and destroyed, are now fortified and inhabited. Then the nations around you that remain will know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt what was destroyed and have replanted what was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will do it. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Once again, I will yield to the plea of the house of Israel and do this for them. I will make their people as numerous as sheep, as numerous as the flocks for offerings at Jerusalem during her appointed feasts. So will the ruined cities be filled with flocks of people. Then they will know 
that I am the Lord. Here ends our reading. Uh, we have a response of thankfulness that is printed there for you in your bulletin. The word of the Lord. Thanks indeed. Let's pray. We know as Christians that we face tough realities in this life. Uh, no one pats us on the back out there in the world because we're following Christ. Um, and, and if there's uh, some issue of immorality that we are around during our week where people are talking about something or doing something, if we bring up, you know, uh, God says in the Bible this instead that people don't thank us. Uh, we know better than to say that because we're a little afraid of what will happen, right? Um, but, but we have tough realities that we, uh, uh, that we live with in, in, in this world. Uh, being a Christian in this world, we, we face hard things. And these are not only for us as individuals, but for us as, as the church. And this is what Ezekiel was dealing with. This is what the people were dealing with as they had been carried off into exile like we saw in 2 Kings 24. And then when Nebuchadnezzar, that was uh, 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 597 B.C. And Ezekiel and these people are carried off. Jehoiachin, the king, the son of David, is carried off into exile. And, and uh, then Nebuchadnezzar uh, comes back for seconds uh, in, in 587 uh, B.C. And he finishes off Jerusalem. Uh, and every important building he knocks down. And he burns the temple with fire. And he carries off all the temple treasuries uh, back into to Babylon. And those show up again in, in Daniel 5, those temple treasuries uh, at, at a feast uh, there that Daniel shows up to. Uh, but these things are going on and God's people are wondering, what are we to do with this? In the hardship that we're enduring as God's people, as God's people Israel, how do we deal with what is going on around us? And the world is a harsh place for us to live, even though we're the ones who know the one who sits enthroned above all the earth, who's created everything. How do we, how do we interact with this? Well, um, that's what we look at this morning for us, as we interact with harsh realities around us, uh, but also as we recognize the good promises that Christ has given to us and good promises that we experience at least in part today. Now, there's something for us to, to realize as we look at this Old Testament passage. You know, when we look at the New Testament, it gives us the, the, um, the, the lines that we follow in terms of interpreting the Old Testament. And one of these things is we see the book of Hebrews, and it takes about everything it can think, and it says these things in the Old Testament, they really speak about Jesus in this way, and that way, and the other way. And they speak about the, us in this way, and that way, and the other way. And so instead of offering animal sacrifices in the Jerusalem temple, the writer of Hebrews says, we recognize that these sacrifices showed us something about who Jesus was, and what that would mean for us as we live our lives here in between the time Christ has ascended to heaven and the time he comes back to the earth. And so for the Jewish folks that the writer of Hebrews wrote to, it was that they were to not offer animal sacrifices anymore because Jesus was both their high priest and he was their once for all sacrifice. And they needed no other priest. They needed no other sacrifice. Jesus likewise in Luke 24 told his disciples and chided them for being slow to understand the things written about him in the Old Testament. He chided them and said, how, how slow you are to understand all the things written of me in the law and the prophets and, and Moses and in the Psalms. And he says that to them, and that gives us our, 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 our railroad track, so to speak, to understand the Old Testament. One of the things that we understand from the Old Testament as well is that the promised land does not remain a geographical entity theologically for us as we, uh, as we look at the Bible today as Christians who are living in this era after Jesus ascended up into heaven. Rather, and we're learning about this in Sunday school uh, right now, uh, rather the promised land uh, represents the church. Um, and if you'd like to fill out blanks in an outline, um, here we go. Uh, if you want to just listen. That's fine, too, however best you, you follow along. 
uh, but there in our introduction, just to kind of get us oriented to understand this passage from Ezekiel 36, the promised land of the Old Testament foreshadows the church. Um, if you're in the church, like right now, you're surrounded by people who are not disputing that God is God and that Jesus is God and he's his son and that forgiveness is only in him. All your neighbors here, all your fellow citizens, and we're called as believers in Jesus, citizens of heaven, all your fellow citizens are in agreement that there is one God who rules over all, who created all things, and he's provided one means of salvation, and that is, that is Jesus. And so everywhere we bump our elbow when we're in this place, uh, we're surrounded by fellow believers. And that was the case in the promised land in the Old Testament. These were all people in covenant with God. They had the law of Moses. Babylon didn't have the law of Moses. Assyria didn't have the law of Moses. Egypt didn't have the law of Moses. But we have that. We have the scriptures. We're the, the heirs of the promised land. And, and so when we leave this place, we go out into what Peter calls in 1 Peter 13, Babylon. And we live in exile. Uh, 1 Peter 1.1 1, 1 calls us exiles, scattered everywhere. Uh, but when we come in this place once a week, uh, we're, in our, we're in our homeland. Uh, we're in the promised land. We're surrounded by uh, other believers. We're, we're, we're in the place where worship happens. And that was the case in the Old Testament promised land as well. So when we look in the Old Testament at things about the promised land, uh, living in the promised land, worshiping in the promised land, getting exiled from the promised land, coming back to the promised land after exile, which are things Ezekiel's talking about, um, we realize that's all conversation about, about the church. So be there in your outline just to be clear. The church today is the promised land for believers in this life. The church today is the promised land for believers in this life. Now, when you die, that promised land becomes heaven. When Jesus returns, that promised land becomes the whole heaven and the whole earth, the new heavens and new earth. Okay, When the meek shall inherit the earth, the Christians inherit the earth, and, and it's only us who are on it. Uh, and there's no dispute anymore when Jesus comes back on the earth, who is God and who is king and who is rightfully to be obeyed. But for now, that place is the church. And we get to, get to experience that uh, at, on Sundays. And then C, as you look at this passage specifically, you see that, that God is addressing the promised land itself. And so when he speaks of the mountains and the hills and the, and the ravines and the valleys, these kind of things, um, he's speaking of, of today that speaks of the church. Okay. So you see there the mountains, hills, ravines, valleys, land, and towns of verses 4, 6, and 8 speak of the church today. And so God is speaking, first of all, through Ezekiel, to these exiles, to people living in Babylon back in the 500s B.C., you know, around 570 B.C., somewhere around there. And he's speaking things to them that are true. And there to hear these words that are spoken of the promised land that they've been dragged away from in exile by Nebuchadnezzar and his troops. And they're to hear these promises about the promised land and how they'll return to the promised land and it'll be a fruitful place there. But as Jesus tells us and the book of Hebrews tells us, we take that and say, yes, but this is not dead scripture. All scripture is profitable. Paul says in 1 Timothy 3.16, all scripture, including Ezekiel, is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for, for correction, for training in righteousness. So we, so we look at the scripture and say, okay, so what does this say about the church? And what does this say about us today? So the first thing it lets us know of is, number one in your outline there, tough realities, tough realities for the church and for you and me. Tough realities for the church today. And it lets us know about this. And, and uh, uh, kind of a big sentence here, and then we'll talk about it, A, in your outline there. It lets us know this. Denominations and congregations will be stolen. Denominations and congregations will be stolen, overtaken by the world. 
by the world's influence, by the world's people, and by those from the world who pose and sometimes believe themselves to be Christians. So the church today, particular churches or denominations as a whole, get stolen, um, just like the promised land was stolen. And, and, and we see there that the promised land was stolen, not just by the Babylonians who had no claim that, that, that the Lord, um, the God of heaven that the Israelites worshipped, um, it, it was, uh, was their God. They had no claim of that. But, but the Edomites come in and take this. And we talked about the Edomites before with Obadiah. Obadiah deals with the Edomites. Edom, those were the descendants of Esau. Remember who Esau's brother was? They were twins. Jacob. And Jacob gets renamed Israel. And these are the Israelites. And so for Edom to take over the land, and one of the things that Obadiah is dealing with, and Ezekiel deals with it in uh, maybe chapter 35, just before here, is that the Edomites had mistreated their brothers. And they had rejoiced when Nebuchadnezzar came in. They rejoiced when Babylon came in and ravaged the land of Israel. And in fact, they laughed at them as they were being, as the Israelites were being carried off into exile. The Edomites were there, perhaps helping Babylon militarily. But also they, they, they snuck around into all the towns in Judah. This is what we read and what we know in history to be the case. They go to all these towns in Judah and take over. And they, they take the fruit of the trees and the treasures that are left there, and they take over and they move into these various places. And so that's spoken of here in this, in, in this passage, that sometimes the people that take over the church are, are, are kind of these relatives. So um, the church is not just affected by the world, by those saying there is no God. It's not just taken over by people saying, well, we're Buddhists or we're, we're Hindu or we're whatever. But, but sometimes the church is taken over by those who in some way are a relation of us. So they come in and, and they inhabit the church. So denominations or particular churches end up being inhabited by people who are not believers. They're, they're Edomites or they're Babylonians, so to speak, and they come in and they take over. And guess what happens when the Edomites live in the land? Guess what happens when the Babylonians come into the land? They don't promote worship of God in the temple. They burn it down. Right? And so we know that this is true today. There, there are members in many churches who aren't believers. And if you say, oh, so, you know, litmus test of whether someone believes the Bible or not in the church, do you believe those who believe don't, those who don't believe in Jesus go to hell? That's the litmus test question. It is. And if the person says, well, yes, I, I do believe that. Apart from Christ, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but him. If, if, you, if you get a yes to that, you know, that answer, yes, only Jesus, their salvation, then you've got a believing church there. And if, if you have a, 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 a shilly-shally uh, on that, uh, run. Run. You're dealing with Edomites at that point. People who have a, a form of godliness but deny, uh, deny its power, as, as Paul says. Um, but members of the church who don't believe, members, they're, they're sitting in the promised land. It says church on their sign. It says church on their website. And they're sitting in seats or pews that were built by people who believed 70 years ago in their particular church or their particular denomination. But also, as we see here in our outline, those who lead it, pastors, elders, church leadership. And so we, we see this in verse 5. Look there in verse 5 in, in your uh, chapter 36 there. This is what the Sovereign Lord says, In my burning zeal have I have spoken against the rest of the nation, so Babylon and everyone else, and against all Edom. So putting that in today's context, it's like God saying, final judgment is coming. It is coming, and it's going to come to two kinds of people. 
It's going to come toward those who say, I don't believe there's a God or I'm, I follow some other God. But it's also going to come to those who are posers, uh, right? Those who are in the church or in the promised land and somehow related to it um, like the Edomites were to Israel. Maybe their grandfather was a believer and a believing member of this particular church or denomination or, or whatever, uh, but, they are, but they are not. But he says, verse 5, And against all Edom, for with glee and with malice in their hearts, they made my land, the promised land, their possession, so that they might plunder its pasture land. So Ezekiel was just describing what had happened when they had been exiled, that the Edomites were there, they were laughing at the Israelites, and the Edomites had just plundered the land. Matthew 15, 14. This was true in Jesus' day. And that's a B point for you there as well. This was true in Jesus' day. As the Pharisees and most of the Jews rejected Jesus, screaming for his crucifixion, yet being religious and claiming Moses. We follow Moses. Abraham is our father. And Jesus says that the leaders of the church, Matthew 15, 14, they were blind guides. They were not believers. They didn't have spiritual sight. So this was true during, it was true during Ezekiel's day. It was true during Jesus' day. There are people who are in the promised land, Pharisees, Sadducees, all the people who would scream for Jesus' crucifixion, who are not believers. Remember, the people screaming for Jesus' crucifixion looked God in the face and said, crucify him. Get him off this planet. Okay. And that's us apart from God giving us new hearts and giving us eyes to, eyes to see. Um, and, and so this uh, Jude speaks of this in chapter, uh, not chapter, Jude chapter 1, the only chapter, uh, verses 17 through 19 that, that uh, Jim read for us, that there are people in the church in these last days, which we're in, the apostles all talk about themselves being in the last days, and, and, and so Jude speaks of that as well. And, and, and there are folks who care nothing for Christ they're seeking their own they're seeking their own glory they're in the church for other in the church for other reasons and so today in our church landscape so to talk about today these Edomites um, kind of come from two different directions and, and it's what we're to be aware of um, one direction is just of, of, of raw um, uncovered disbelief uh, in certain doctrines of the Bible. So it's, it's what we call liberal theology. It, it's those who don't believe in hell, don't believe Jesus is the only way for eternal life, who say things like I've heard said to me in, in churches that are of this, this stripe, everybody is God's children, a, God, a child of God, and the Muslims are, and the Buddhists are, and we'll all be in heaven together. I, I literally heard that and had to debrief my oldest two daughters about that after we heard that um, during a church during a church service, um, but that's that's one way that that the Edomites uh, get into the Promised Land. Um, they still bear the name of Christ. It's a Christian church, um, but they're they're plundering it and using the church for its own sake. But then on the other side, the side that that uh, you know might hurt us a little bit a little bit more if we're of a different. <laughs> Uh, a stripe of things. It's the it's the conservative side. Now, when I say conservative, I don't mean if, if when, when I say conservative, I mean um, I don't mean this. If you believe the Bible and that's what you mean by conservative, yes. But there's a, this other conservatism that is a social, political, cultural conservatism, and if and that's the that's the conservatism that says. I like America in the 1950s. And if you stray from that, then you have an enemy. And if you proclaim that what Jesus is saying and what America was doing in the 1950s culturally or socially or whatever it was are two different things, then you've got a fight on your hands. Okay? Because our loyalty is to Jesus and, and Jesus alone. 
We want to be loyal to him. So we want to be careful of those things. So like we said in point B, this was true in Jesus' day. The Pharisees um, were screaming for his crucifixion, uh, yet they believed themselves to be, here's your second blank in your B point there. They believed themselves to be God's people. And they vehemently claimed to be God's people. We follow Moses, and we saw it in John 8. We're sons of Abraham. And Jesus says, no, you are not, because Abraham followed me. And you're against me, and you're plotting my death. And because I speak truth, you're plotting to kill me right now. But when, God, when I spoke truth to Abraham, he just followed me. He left Ur and, and took off. And he went down into the promised land because I told him to back then. Okay, so that can be true uh, today. People who see themselves as God's people uh, but are not. Um, Jesus said to these folks, Satan is your father. Or, or uh, Paul said in 1 Timothy 3 that such folks who are in the church in these last days, he says to Timothy, calling their own day the last, the last days, uh, will be lovers of themselves. They will have a form of godliness, but they will deny its power. That is, if you just look on the outside, they're church people. You know, the, as uh, demonstrated as for us well, Dana Carvey with his church lady skit. They're church people. They go to church every Sunday. They're, you know, a, a superintendent of Sunday school or whatever they're doing in the church. And that may be their main social affiliation. It may be the thing they most do with their time outside of their vocation. And they may be utterly committed to it, but so were the Pharisees. The Pharisees were vocationally committed to the God who had uh, written to Moses and given him the law. Okay, so just because someone believes he's one of God's people um, doesn't necessarily mean that he is. C. Uh, this results in the true church who loves Jesus. So you define the true church, those who love Jesus, who see him and say, finally, you're here. Okay, like the disciples. Um, experiencing the world's scorn. Experiencing the world's scorn. And that's what's spoken of here in this passage in, in uh, verse 6, the second half of it. We experience the, the world's scorn, both from false, non-believing churches... Oh, you're one of those churches that believes in hell. Oh, you're one of those churches that doesn't believe in a woman's right to choose. Oh, you're one of those churches that, that believes, you know, that uh, uh, bisexuality and all that thing is, is not okay and that people are, you know, all, all that stuff, you know, that the scripture's pretty clear on. Um, you're one of those, and that's, that's persecution we get from within. From, you know, I grew up with a pastor who was at the pro abortion rally down in Columbus, Ohio. Um, for for abortion, um, so you get that you know churches like that 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 persecute you for a simple belief in what the Bible says is true, uh, but also you get uh, this persecution or experience the world scorn from those who are openly in the or in the openly non-believing world. Okay, that's your second blank there, the openly non-believing world. Okay, so. That's the bad news, uh, <laughs> that the church is not pure. And, and we, we declared that as we did our, our, declarate, uh, uh, our confession of our faith this morning on the front of your first page there, are all churches churches? And how pure are churches? And we, we answered there, no, there are some churches that have so degenerated that they are no longer a church of Jesus. And even among the best churches, there's a mix because we all have this, this sin nature that kind of that kind of gets in the way. But that's the, that's the bad news. Things have been uh, muddied uh, for us and that we endure, we endure scorn. We endure scorn in our lives because we're a people of exile. Okay, until Jesus comes back, this earth is a place where we live in exile. When he comes back, it becomes our, our homeland. Okay, so number two, good things, good things. Good things that God has for the church today and for you personally. So good things that God has for the church as a whole and for you personally. 
And, and you see there in verse 9, look there at verse 9. You just, you can see there God's concern. He looks down. He sees the scorn we're enduring. He sees our uh, exilic uh, existence. Uh, he sees that we're, we're not, we're strangers in a foreign land. That the things that we've been, uh, we really are built to be with him. And, and we're living in a land where others aren't living for him. And, and we're getting beat, uh, beat up from the left and right. Um, so A, first of all, um, Ezekiel declares some things that are true that are true uh, about what God does for his church. So that's your uh, A point there, what God does for his church and for you as a part of it. Just things God does, that God accomplishes for you. One, he cleanses us of our sins. We see that in verse 33. There in verse 33, he cleanses us of our sins. Um, number two, he fills the church with other believers. He fills the church with other believers or as it puts in, in these verses, inhabitants. So you have the whole idea here in Ezekiel 36 that the land is generally desolated. It's, it's empty. Or you saw in, in 2 Kings 25 that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had left just a few people behind, the poorest of the poor, that he had no use for, just to be in the land so it wouldn't get overgrown with weeds and, and so forth. So the land would be of, of, some, of some use. But what God does is he sees us in our exile and he returns us to the land. What that means for you and me is that God has brought us into the church. He saw us outside of the promised land and he brought us in. And he brought us in, presumably, by faith. He gave us eyes to see. He gave us a new heart, as he speaks of here. He gave us his spirit so we could see, so we could hear the gospel. And, and we believed, and we became citizens of the promised land, citizens of heaven, Philippians 3, Philippians 3.20. And so God promises here, and you see it in verses 9 through 12 and 24. Um, look at verse 24 here. He says, for I will take you out of the nations. Okay, this is Ezekiel talking to Israelites who were in Babylon and had been scattered into some other nations too. And God says in verse 24, I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and I will bring you back into your own land. Okay. And so this speaks, you know, scripture speaks of election as well. And this speaks of election too. God is a people and he's going to bring all his people back into the church. He's going to bring them in. And so that's good news for us. He brings us in. He cleanses uh, us of our, he cleanses us of our, our sins. You saw in the declaration of the gospels, you look on the front page of that, um, that uh, on that day, uh, on that day uh, that he uh, brings us back, he will uh, cleanse us. He will cleanse us of our, of our sins. Okay. Um, brings his people in through giving them faith in Jesus. So that's going on today. During our era where things are tough for the church. And they experienced that. I put a reference there for you in Acts chapter 2. Where God was adding daily to their number those who were being saved. And that's going on around the earth. Despite the fact that there are some churches that are really no churches at all now except in name. Um, Jesus is still working. And he's, still, he's bringing inhabitants into the land. The land was desolate. The land was Jesus on a cross, John the Baptist hiding behind Jesus' mother and the other Mary, hoping that nobody saw them. The disciples hiding in, the upper, in an upper room and scared when they heard a knock on the door. That was a desolate land for the kingdom of God. That was a desolate promised land at that time. But Jesus brings in inhabitants into the land. And, and Peter goes and boldly, 40 days longer, after, 40 days later, uh, he goes and he preaches the gospel of Jesus and how Jesus is risen from the dead and that there's salvation in the name of Jesus. And he calls his fellow countrymen, the Jews who had gathered for this Jewish feast of Pentecost in Acts 2, to believe. And so thousands did. And then he preaches again and thousands more do. And so daily people are being added to the church. Acts 247 and that's God fulfilling beginning to fulfill this promise in Ezekiel 
that God would bring inhabitants back into the land from all the lands into which they were scattered. And so the apostles not only stay in Jerusalem and, and in Judea, but they go out into Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth to gather in, not back to Jerusalem, but to gather into the heavenly Jerusalem where Jesus is, inhabitants into the church, the promised land of today. See how that works. So that's God's promise for the church. He's, he's growing the church. He's adding inhabitants to us. And so that should make us of good courage as we, as we talk to others uh, about Jesus and more about that in a, a minute. But we see the picture of Jesus in Revelation 6-2 that I've listed there for you is Jesus is a conquering warrior. He's on a white horse and, and he's got a bow and he's, uh, he's uh, I always want to say conquesting. He is conquering. <laughs> he's conquering and you know who he's conquering? You and me. He conquered sinful, prideful John. And he, he, put his, he put his arrow, he put the sword of the Spirit upon my nose and said, choose, surrender or die. And I said, I surrender. Things are much better in your kingdom. And they were much better than I knew back then. You know, every day I realize how good of a decision that was because things are better in Jesus' kingdom than they are in the kingdom of the world. And so that's what Jesus is doing today. He's riding about like this rider on this white horse and he's conquering new citizens, offering to all, be a citizen in my kingdom instead of a citizen in the world. Things are better with me. I will protect you now and into all, into all eternity. And so Jesus says in Matthew 16, 18 to his disciples, I will build my church. And that's what Jesus is doing for us today. He's building his church. He's adding inhabitants into the land. Or uh, Matthew 13, 31 uh, through 33, Jesus tells us two parables of the mustard seed and, and the, the dough the bread dough. And he says, here's what the kingdom of God is like. When I die on the cross, it will be like this mustard seed. There's hardly, there are hardly going to be any inhabitants. It's going to be desolate. And people are going to walk by me on the cross and they're going to mock and say, look at this desolate land. Like the people did during Ezekiel's day. But that desolate land will grow. Jesus talked about his own death and said, unless a seed falls into the ground and dies, it won't produce fruit. And so Jesus hangs up there on that cross and people walk by and they scorn him and they scorn his disciples who have followed him. But then that little seed, that mustard seed there on the cross by the gospel, it grows and it grows and it grows and it becomes bigger and bigger. Or Jesus told the, the, the parable right after that, it's the kingdom of God is like a, 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 a lump of dough and you add yeast into it, and then you go away and you kind of keep it warm and you come back and whew, it's grown. And he's describing the kingdom of God over the ages. It just keeps, at every day, he keeps adding citizens to his kingdom. And it keeps, his kingdom keeps growing, the church keeps growing and growing and growing. And uh, dead saints whose souls are up around Jesus' throne in heaven right now, and, and the church here on earth. Uh, so Jesus fills this church with other with other believers. And then three, three, he builds us up, those who he's brought into the land, inhabitants, he builds us up in maturity. He builds us up into maturity. And this idea of building we see in verses 10, 33, and 35. Uh, we see it as well in 1 Peter 2, verses 4 and 5. It, it says that we're like a, a, a temple, a spiritual house. And that when he gave us his spirit, we became spiritual stones that were walls of this house. And he's building us up as a, as a spiritual house. Uh, Ephesians 4, uh, Jim read that for us this morning. And, and it talks to us about how he gives different gifts in the church. Jesus did when he ascended on high. He gave gifts to his church so that in the church you could be, you could be built up in your faith. You could grow stronger in your faith in God. And, and just as the building was going to happen in Restoration Israel, when God returned his people back to the promised land, which he did in 538 BC, literally houses would be rebuilt. The walls of Jerusalem would be rebuilt. 
the fortified cities would be refortified. Their walls would be rebuilt. The temple would be rebuilt. And, and, and the, the, the nation would rise up from the dust, from the ashes. But that's a description of your life. The New Testament uses this idea of building as one, the church is being built up as a whole, the land is being built up as a whole, but you are being built up as a believer. You're being built up as a believer. He builds us up in maturity. Um, so both corporately, Ephesians 4, 2, and then individually, he builds us up to be more like Jesus, and that's Colossians 2, 7. And then fourth thing, fourth thing God does for us, the church. He makes us, the church, a fruitful place. He makes us a fruitful place. And we see these references to the land. As God speaks to the land, you mountains, you hills, you valleys, he says, I will produce branches and fruit upon you. I'll fill you with fruit. And so that's verses 8, 11 and 12, 34 and 35. Um, and so what does this now in the New Testament mean for us in the church? Uh, two different ways in which the church experiences these things that Ezekiel said would be true. Um, a, two kinds, of, two kinds of fruit in the New Testament church. A, we'll be fruitful in producing new believers. Okay? Fruitful in producing new believers. And, and you see this in the, the idea that you see like from 11 and 12. It's, back then it was physical descendants, sons and daughters. And so you look there at the end of verse 12. No longer will the, will the land be so harsh to you that you lose your sons and daughters in war with the Babylonians coming against you. But now you'll be back in the land and you'll be abundantly producing children. And in the New Testament, it's not that the physical reproduction, but it's the reproduction through disciples. It's, it's Matthew 28, not that we don't have kids. Some of us do. But, but the, the idea, this is taken from the, uh, from the Old Testament to speak of this spiritual reproduction. That is, disciples are made in the church. And so Jesus speaks to this in John 15 as well. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Apart from me, you will produce no fruit. But with me, as you abide in me, you will produce, you'll produce much fruit. And so that's what the church is doing. It's producing new believers. But it's fruitful in this other sense. B in your outline there. You as an individual Christian are made fruitful because God has given you his spirit. And we speak of Paul in uh, uh, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, that we have, because we have his spirit, we have the fruit of the spirit produced in us. So we become more loving and patient and kind and, 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 and gentle, and we gain more, more self-control in these kind of things. So we're fruitful in possessing the fruit of the Spirit. We're fruitful in producing new believers. Um, now, B, we have a role in these things. I've just talked about things that God's just said. I'm going to do these things. Now, things for you folks, things for you folks and for me to do. Your role or things for you to do, that's your blank. Things for you to do that are part of these good things. Number one, plow and sow. I have a Bible that is... Um, it's British. Uh, my my uh, sister lived in England, and she got a new international version Bible in 1986, and it's British. And so it, it said, I almost, put in, I almost put in here the wrong kind of plow. P, they spelled P-L-O-U-G-H. Um, but uh, so plow, P-L-O-W, and sow. Plow and sow, plow and sow, right? <laughs> English is easy to learn, right? Yeah, so P-L-O-W and S-O-W, plow and sow. What do we mean here? And, and God speaks to this in verse 9. He says, you land, promised land, here's what's going to happen to you when I restore you to health. There's going to be plowing and sowing. And then there'll be fruit. And so our role for there to be fruit, now God produces the fruit, right? That's the work of his spirit. And he talks about that in Ezekiel. He talks about that in John 15. He talks, talks about that in, in, Galatians, in Galatians 5. But we have a role. We have a role in this fruit being produced, and it's plowing and sowing. Now, if you're talking strictly agricultural, plowing is when you rough up the field, okay, so that the soil's good. And then you, so, you, you, you soil. You, you, you sow, and you plant seeds. You plant seeds in the ground that you've just roughed up and made loose 
so that the roots can grow easily. Okay? And, and, and we do that as well. And Jesus uses those terms very much so. Matthew 13, he talks about people being soil. Some soil is hard. Some soil is, has rocks all through it. Some soil has thorns all through it. And some soil is just good. It's just good soil. And you plant in it and it, and it grows. But God says that we're to be people. We come back into the promised land and we plow and we sow. And, and, and what is that? Well, sowing definitely the New Testament defines. And, and that's, your, um, that's your B point there. I'm skipping A. I'll get back up to A. Your B point. Uh, speak with non-believers. Okay? Speak with them. Speak with them that Jesus is God and that he forgives sins. Speak with non-believers that Jesus is God and that he forgives sins. Jesus, when he gives that parable of the soils, the rocky, the, the, the thorny, and all that good soil, he says the gospel, when he explains to his disciples, the gospel is the seed. And I'm the sower of the seed. And the disciples of him become the sowers of the seed. So we speak to non-believers the gospel. Jesus is God, and he forgives sins. He's the one who can forgive because he is God. He's your creator. He's also judge. And so he's the one who can pardon you at final judgment, and he's offering you forgiveness. So we proclaim that to non-believers, and that's sowing. But how do we plow? Well, plowing is establishing believer, relationships with non-believers. So that's your, that's your A point there. Develop relationships with non-believers. This is something we should be doing. Developing relationships with non-believers. This is plowing the land, having a relationship with a non-believer, so we can sow with that non-believer. We can communicate the gospel to that non-believer so that fruit, John 15, can be produced. So that, as Ezekiel says, more people will be on this land. I will increase the inhabitants. Okay. Number two, second thing for us to do, besides plowing and sowing, developing relationships with non-believers and, and telling them that Jesus is God and he forgives sins. Number two, aim yourself at, aim at and pursue being built up to be more like Jesus. In other words, A, you, you can write in there, I, a is I have a role in my being built up in the faith. Jude, verse 20. But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in your most holy faith, he says to the believers. So we have a role. We don't just sit around on the couch and, and hum or sit around on the couch and watch our favorite show and God builds us up in the faith. No, he says, build yourselves up in the faith. Now, God produces the growth in us. He produces the maturity. But this is speaking of how we avail ourselves to, and that's um, your B point there, that you need to avail yourself to the means God gives you in the church to be more like Jesus. So Jim read for us this morning from Ephesians chapter 4. And it says, Jesus, when he arose on high, he descended down to the earth and he ministered to us. He taught his disciples and then he ascended. And when he ascended, he, he gave gifts to men. That is, he gave in the church all this giftedness that he also speaks of, that Paul also speaks of in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. And you, as a believer in Jesus, have a set of gifts that God has given you in the church, and he's kind of smashed us all together. You know, like those modern painters, you know, who just throw the paint up against the canvas. That's all faith ever did, right? You know, no, just random throwing of, of paint. Of it. No, he, he puts us all together and, and he, he, he gives different giftedness in the church so that we can be built up. And so he gives pastors and teachers so you're not torn, you're tossed about by every wind of, of doctrine. But he also gives encouragers so that when you're feeling down and thinking about chucking it all, somebody comes up and says, hey, how are you doing? You know, we all know people like, like that in our lives that are real encouragers to us. He gives people who are our great servants. And, you know, we have servants in the church who come and set up these chairs. You know, all kinds of things that are being done, being done in the church. But God provides for you a promised land situation. A situation in which you can come in where you're not having to interact with foreigners all the time. He's getting you out of your exile. He's bringing you in the church and he gives you all that you need in the promised land to live and to thrive in the promised land. And so he tells us to avail ourselves to what he has in the church, 
the word, sacraments, prayer, fellowship with his people, that we might grow in him, that we might be built up in, as Jude puts it, our most, our most holy faith. Okay? Third thing, last thing to do. So the things we do, the things we do, we plow and sow. Okay, we develop relationships with other non with non-believers, and we we tell them about Jesus. And then ourselves, we aim at and pursue being built up in the faith. What's there in the church that I can take advantage of so that I can be built up in my faith? And then three, this big message for us, big picture message: value the church, value the church. Um, this is very counterculture to the church in the United States today. Uh, it's, it's popular to say I'm a follower of Jesus. That's great in and of itself. Be a follower of Jesus. But Jesus died for the sake of his church. Jesus said, and I will build my church. He didn't say I will build individual believers. Now he would do that. But he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So Jesus cares about the church. The church is Yes, an institution that he establishes for the safeguarding of his truth. Or as Paul puts it in his letter to the, the, um, second, in 2 second Timothy, a pillar of the truth is the church. It's what holds up and supports the truth. It keeps the church going. One of the reasons I'm a believer today, even though I grew up in a church where I never had a believing pastor, one of the things God used is I had hymns that were written by believers. And I had written prayers written by believers 150 years ago, these things were. And I had creeds to read written by believers 400 years ago. And I heard what the Bible and, and, and the service contained readings from the scriptures. And even though the people reading these things, even though the people playing the organ didn't believe any of this, I got to hear it as a little boy. So when they got, because the church, the institution, and all its institutional deadness still served as a pillar of the truth. It still held the gospel. So my dad comes to faith at 45 years old and he's weeping as he sings this, these hymns because it had just been dead to him. But the church growing up in it as a boy with believing parents, he himself not being a believer, the church had served as a pillar of these truths. And so God gave him a new heart and gave him his spirit. And all of a sudden, my dad understood all this stuff. Or when I was in eighth grade and the gospel first gets shared to me, um, these things that God had built into me through the pillar of the, the truth, which is the church, made sense. I knew Jesus died. I believed he was God. I believed he was God's son. I believed he had ascended to heaven. I had no clue what the gospel was. And so when the gospel was shared, I had the specific response, oh, so this is why Jesus died, I believe. But he had used the church. He had used the church, a pillar of the truth for, for, for me. So value, value the church. And, and you see this in, in verse 12 and verse 8. Look at verse 12 there. I will cause people, my people Israel, to walk upon you. They will possess you and you will be their inheritance okay so that's our uh that's our a point there treat treat the church as god's inheritance for you his gift for you ezekiel's peers in exile in babylon were to say ah that's what i long for the promised land that's my inheritance and that's the way joshua had spoken to it when the people first went into the promised land it was their inheritance and we're to, to view the church in that way this is god's treasure is his gift for us it's my inheritance i get this i get this place where all these gifts are that help me be built up in the faith i get this place that proclaims to me and reminds me i am not crazy for believing jesus is god that reminds me I'm a sinner and keeps me humble so that I don't treat people like garbage during the week because I realize I'm a sinner too. The church does that for me. And so the church is valued greatly by me. It's my inheritance. It's what God gives me here until I see him face to face in heaven or if he comes back before then in the new heavens and new earth. Second way of valuing the church, treat the church as your home. Treat the church 
as your home. Um, verse 8. Look at verse 8 there. He says, But you, O mountains of Israel, will produce branches and fruit for my people Israel, for they will soon come home. The promised land for believers is home. The church for believers today is home. So let's talk about what home means. One, there. Home is the place where you're safe. Relationally. I mean, in Ezekiel's day, it would be militarily, too. Um, they'd be safe there because God would be blessing them there, and as they followed the Lord, he would protect their land from uh, uh, future, future Babylonians who would come in and take, it, take the land from them. But the, the, uh, the church is a place where you're safe relationally. Um, uh, last night we were out uh, at um, uh, the Cheesecake Factory. Thank you, we finally used that. Um, um, we had a gift certificate there, and we went out for Mallory's birthday, we, uh, and um, we were there sitting around at a round table, my family, and we were doing all kinds of stupid stuff at our table, you know, to, to figuring out who could make their eyebrows go like this the fastest, and who couldn't do that at all, like me, I can just, you know, I'm like both at once, but I have a daughter who can go like this, I mean, literally, her eyebrows are going this fast, everyone's looking at you guys, um, <laughs> see who's the reddest, and you'll know who that is. Um, and, and some who could make one eye grow, you know, and we were sitting and doing that and just laughing. Why? Because this was safe. We were home. Uh, it, was, it was five of Ma Mallard. Yeah, Monica got left out. She got in at about 1130 last night at the airport, so she wasn't with us. But, um, but we were safe. And the church is a place relationally we're safe. We come in these doors and we can let down. And we don't have to worry about protecting ourselves. And if someone, is someone going to make fun of me because of my faith? Or is someone going to challenge me to do something that's immoral? And, you know, we're always on guard when we're outside the church, but, but church is our home. It's a place where we can relax. And, and our beliefs aren't challenged. Uh, at least um, our, our, our right beliefs aren't challenged. Our wrong beliefs are challenged in here. But our right beliefs are in church. So church is a place where we're, where we're safe and we're to long for it and consider it God's gift for us. Number two, the church is a place where we have our brothers and sisters. And for, for some of us, we have brothers and sisters physically who aren't our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we understand that we have a closer relationship in many ways with our brothers and sisters in Christ in the church than we do with our own brothers and sisters if they're uh, people who are uh, uh, adamantly against the church and against, against Jesus. But this is the place where we have our brothers and sisters. All who have received Christ, John 1, 12, are children of God versus being friends with the world. And, and so this is our home where our brothers and sisters are, where people are who love us and care for us and who are rooting for us are. And then thirdly, a church is a place where you get your values. Our values are established by our by our home. So, you know, I, I like the college team I like because my parents both went to that college. Okay, that's that's why I didn't go there. Um, but what but we have certain values because of what our parents instill in us, even if they weren't trying. The things you watch, the things you care about, the things that you don't care about. Are you a hunting and fishing family? Are you a, this kind of family or whatever? Do you fix your car? Do you, do you take your car in to get fixed? That's all di different values that you have from the home that you grew up in. But this is the case. This is the case for the church. Our values come from the church. Um, we value the church because it's the place that, that gives us our values that make sense in this life. So conclusion, wrapping these things all together. In this era in which the church is embattled, in, the, in this era in which the church is embattled from within and from without, be grateful. Be grateful for Christ making you well through his faithful church. So as the church is embattled and you are embattled, living in this exile of a life, be grateful. Uh, for Christ making you well through his faithful church, building you up through it. And you then seek the churches and your own building up. That's God's design for you, Ezekiel 36. When he tells the people, you're going to go back to the land and you're going to build the land up again, they weren't going to say, oh, that's cool. Who's going to do that for us? 
They knew they would go back to the land and they would be building up their own houses, but God would bless them as they did that work of, of building up. And that's what we, the church, are about as we build up the church through getting the message out, sowing and plowing and sowing, and as we seek our own building up to be more like Jesus, uh, God blesses us. Let's pray.